Thanks again so much for having me today, Kevin, and congratulations on your award from WFG National Title Insurance Company. It's agents like you that are keeping all of us uh, ahead of the curve, you know, and, and what a story, what a testimony to you guys that you were part of the mess and came in and, and covered it up. As a former title agent here in Texas and New Mexico, I had a few scary situations too. Um, and therein lies where this class originally came from. The original format of this class I created probably five years ago, but it's morphed into what it is today. Um, so thanks again to Misty and everybody at WFG National Title Insurance Company for having me, and especially you, Kevin, Independence Title. Uh, my name is Sam Trimble. I'm a marketing technology director with West, and we are a sister company of WFG. One of the things that we focus on as a tech and marketing company actually is uh, <clears throat> wire fraud and cyber fraud, education, and also protection. So we actually have a product that we were awarded several awards by Inman and Housing Wire over the last couple of years, including the Top Innovation Award in 2020 for something that we have called West Protect. We work with title companies just like you all over the country uh, doing phishing simulations with their staff, answering questions uh, with a help desk that's 24 hours a day, doing lots of employee training. And then we've also averted, uh, and this number is from 2021, we've actually averted over $25 million. That number is closer to 50. It almost doubled during the pandemic. We saw a ton of, uh, of uh, wire fraud attempts going on during the pandemic, but we have a total suite of tools. So this is the stuff that we do every single day. Um, so <clears throat> obviously, this is a what's called the NORS map. It's I'm a nerd, and so I love this thing. You can go and update it. I took this screen grab just a few weeks ago. And so you can see uh, the attack targets by a lot. It's a little blurry, but uh, number one by literally like 5,000 times uh, is the United States. And you can tell by these, it's coming from all over the world. With what's going on right now, we're seeing more and more from this little country uh, named Russia. And so there's a lot happening coming out of Russia at this time, attempting to attack our banking systems, our federal government systems. And when it comes to our banking systems, we are, as the real estate industry, we are highly tied into that through the mortgage industry, the real estate industry, and the title industry. So the attacks are coming. It's not when they're coming, uh, it's if they're coming, and they certainly are. And it's up over 600% over the pandemic. So I use this map uh, and I just threw this one in there last year, but I used this map when I when I created this. This is a list of every large organization off the top of my head uh, that had uh, fallen victim to cyber attack over the last few years. And so when I think of the United States Department of Defense, I think of Home Depot. Remember when Target was compromised and if you had scanned your card at a Target in the last like 36 months, about a year ago, your info was compromised. The IRS has been compromised. Netflix. We remember a bunch of things about Netflix and then uh, Sony Picture Studios coming out of North Korea a few years ago, right? So Kim Jong-un didn't like something that was being made, and there were a bunch of attacks coming out of North Korea. The moral of this story is, if it can happen to these people, do you think it's possible that it could happen to us and our small businesses, and especially uh, a lot of us as a real estate agent? You know, we use free email services like Gmail, AOL, uh, Yahoo, you know, MSN, things like that. So if, if it can happen to them, it can absolutely happen to anybody. So I want to, uh, this is a little roadmap of what we're going to talk about today. Kind of the top cyber threat trends. We're going to talk about social engineering. You've heard the term, but what the heck is it? We're going to talk a little bit about phishing, which is typically the way, you know, there's vishing and other types too, but phishing is generally speaking the way that most people are inserting themselves into these conversations. We're going to talk a little bit about wire transfer scams, which can tend to be the crux of what's happening in the real estate industry right now. And I'll touch on business email compromise as a part of all of that. So there's going to be our stops along the way. You've probably heard those terms a lot before, but we're going to try and break them down. Um, so at the end of the day, hackers are targeting you, real estate agents. They're targeting lenders, title companies, um, buyers and sellers of real estate on a daily basis, hour by hour, minute by minute. They're often sending phishing emails to anyone involved in a real estate transaction and just hoping that someone will click on something. And when someone does, they're inserting themselves into the conversation and they're lying there and wait, waiting for a real estate transaction to get close to closing. Typically, right before closing, these fraudsters will send fake wiring instructions to real estate agents, to sellers, to buyers, um, and to title companies uh, and your customers, right? Your buyers and your sellers of real estate are getting emails that look like they're coming from you. If those funds get wired, 
um, like Kevin was talking about, there's a chance that they're most likely gone. Every once in a while, there's someone that comes in and really doubles down and works really hard to try and recover some of it. Most times it's a portion, just like Kevin just said, they were able to recover half, which is very rare, by the way, to even recover half. And it's amazing that that was able to be accomplished. But typically speaking, it's all gone. Normally it hits another account, is out of the country within moments, literally, and untraceable. Um, so at the end of the day, that's kind of what it looks like. Social engineering. We've all heard that term. We've heard it on the news. But what does that actually mean? I, this is the, the most succinct and perfect def definition I found. It's the clever manipulation of the natural human tendency to trust. Right. So as humans, naturally, we walk around and when someone comes up to us and says something or requests something, we trust that they're coming from a decent place. Right. We don't want to walk around thinking that everyone is trying to trick us or fool us or fraud us in some way. And so social engineering is simply that people um, preying on our natural tendency to think other people are good people. Right. We like other people. We want to trust them. And that's all social engineering is. And I always. Uh, think of there was a Dave Chappelle skit that reminds me of this but um, everybody in Netflix is now cracking down on this too but imagine if you were walking down the street and somebody came up to you and said hey Kevin what's up man hey can I borrow your Netflix login we would look at them and think they were crazy yet if we receive an email of somebody saying hey congrats on your real estate transaction we're getting close to closing would you remind resending your social security number and by the way here's the new wiring instructions. We just changed banking relationships. Call us if you have any questions. And people are like, here's my social, here's my life savings, but you wouldn't give somebody your Netflix password if they asked for it. The reason is, is we're not doing, uh, our buyers and our sellers of real estate are not doing real estate transactions every day. This is something that they're doing once every several years, wiring money, this is something that they do once a few times in their whole life. They're not familiar with the process. And so when somebody says, hey, here's the new wiring instructions, their natural tendency to trust comes in, the social engineering comes in, and they say, sure, and they wire the money. So social engineering, a psychological manipulation of people into performing actions or divulging confidential information, making them feel like it's no big deal, and ten times out of, or and nine times out of ten, they'll end up doing it if we don't warn them ahead of time and educate them on the process. It's a confidence trick for the purpose of gathering information or frauding them or gaining access to their system, which is what happens in a lot of cases. Many of you, I'm sure, have heard of ransomware. We talked about that at that conference last week, Kevin. And so at the end of the day, there's people from all over the world getting into computers and encrypting all of the information. They're doing it in hospitals. Can you imagine? All of, all of the information in a hospital being totally encrypted and their systems being shut down, ventilators not working, defibrillators not working, operating rooms being unfunctional, and they're saying, hey, pay us or we won't decrypt it. And then half the time when they pay, they don't do it anyway. D this differs from a traditional con in that it's usually a single step of many other steps, right? It's not a one hit wonder where it's a con, they walk away, they're gone. This is a long game for them, but because of the amounts of money involved in a real estate transaction, it's worth it for them to stick around and take their time. So 98% of cyber attacks rely on social engineering. So this is exactly how this process is beginning. And 43% of IT professionals said they have been targeted by social engineering schemes in the last 12 months. That is almost half of all t IT professionals across industries, by the way. This is not just title. This is not just real estate. This is not just the lending and banking world. This is across industries. Almost half of all IT professionals say they have been targeted. And that's just over the last 12 months. So what the heck is phishing, right? We've heard the term. Um, hacker, the hackers are using basic bait like a generic email. We're going to show you some examples in just a minute um, that usually has either a, a malicious attachment or a malicious link, right? They send these emails to thousands of people. If you're a realtor, you can commiserate with me on this. I'm still a card carrying member of NAR. We are on every freaking mailing list that has ever been created in the history of mankind as a real estate agent. Are we not? We're getting emails from everybody about everything. And so, do you think it's hard for people to gather huge caches of emails for people in a specific industry? No, it's pretty easy. The sign company that spammed me this morning trying to get me to, more buy, to buy more name writers, they got my email somewhere. So if they could get it, do you think hackers could get it from other countries? They're literally sending thousands of these emails. All they need is for one or two people to click. 
That's all they need. Their rate doesn't have to be good on that return. It's different than our marketing emails, right? Kevin and I send out a marketing email and we're hoping that we have a, you know, a 15 to 35% click through. These people need 1%, less than 1%. They're addressed to you. They've done research on you and your industry. It's relevant content, typically speaking. The branding and the logos, the signatures, the formatting usually looks legit. Um, so what does this lead to? If we were to click on or open that attachment, what does it lead to? It can be a bunch of different things. It can lead to credential harvesting where they take all of your logins and passwords. It can lead to redirecting you to a malicious site that will do the same thing. It can install software on your computer uh, or your cell phone without you knowing it. It can, uh, if you download these attachments, ransomware installation could be a part of that, right? The, what we just talked about. Um, but at the end of the day, there's ways to prevent all of this. What we have is a failure to communicate. I can't remember what movie that's from, but like what we have here is a failure to communicate. But despite ongoing training and publicity and all of these things, especially in our industry, we're still seeing the attacks relentless, relentlessly coming and they're getting more and more clever with how they do it. 56% of information technology decision makers say targeted phishing attacks are their top security threat. The number one threat for most IT people is phishing and 30% of phishing, phishing messages are opened, right? So almost a third of all phishing messages are opened by the recipient. And then 12% go on to click the malicious link or download the attachment or whatever. So in, in um, the lending space and the title space and often in the uh, real estate space, fake invoices have been seen as the number one disguise for distributing malware, right? So Kevin and I, we get an invoice, we want to pay it. We want to take care of our vendors, man. We pay them quick. We pay them uh, appropriately. So when I get an invoice, if I'm unfamiliar with it, I get a little bit of a like nervous reaction. Like, oh my gosh, did somehow, did something fall through the cracks? They know that I'm going to feel that way. So invoices have been the number one disguise lately for distributing malware. In the real estate space, what is it? It's CDs. Oh my gosh, there's a closing come up that I totally forgot about. Oh my gosh, that's this week. Um, Here's a couple examples, and a couple of them are oldies but goodies that I like to use, and one of them relatively new. This one was from this past summer. Uh, this looked exactly like a, a lender that I'm very familiar with, um, and it looked exactly like, if you look at the email there, it seems to say the correct email, and this came in and said, I had 30 days uh, before a secured message expires. Click here for your secured message, right? Malware. Um, DocuSign is one that we were getting a ton of last year. There's still, it seems like they've shifted to a couple other things, but I'm still seeing a lot of DocuSign ones. Hey, don't forget to sign this amendment. You know, closing is next week. We need it ASAP. All you end up doing is, is clicking on this view complete document and that's all you need to do. So if you get a DocuSign with an address that you're unfamiliar with or a name that you're unfamiliar with, you should be double checking that stuff before you do anything. Um, one of the things that we've done with West Protect is we have a service, an email address that you can forward that email to, and they will look at it, make sure it's legit, and then tell you whether you're good to go or not. Um, this one I always love. It's an oldie but a goodie because this is like one of the best examples of social engineering I've ever seen. So look at the date here, December 20th, right? The day before my birthday. That's, I'm sure that's what you were all thinking, but it's, it's just a few days before a pretty major holiday here where a lot of people are sending each other gifts for Christmas, right? So keep in mind that date. And what happens is they say, sir, madam, your order has not been delivered because the specified address was not correct. Please fill this form and send it back to your reply. If you don't reply within a week, we'll give you your money back less 17, whatever that means, and reserve a time after the Christmas holidays. So this is basically saying, hey, that gift that you bought for someone that you forgot about is not going to be delivered to them on time unless you verify this address. And guess what? We're only five days away from Christmas. You better hurry up, right? There's so many telltales in this one. It's a generic, you know, generic variable. We don't talk like that anyway, sir, madam. Best uh, back less 17. This is not written correctly. So this is a pretty obvious one, but these are getting better and better. But if I don't remember something that I bought from Best Buy, even though it's only five days before Christmas, there are so many red flags here, it's unbelievable. But can you imagine, you know, maybe our, our parents or some of our clients or family or friends seeing this and thinking, oh my gosh, I bought this gift for somebody for Christmas. It's not going to get there in time. What do I do? I need to make sure that I fill out this form and have the address correct. You could see how this one would be 
uh, one that would work very well. And it's sad, but it was done really well. So the things to look at are this, right? So you can fill in this descriptive on any email service that you want. I could put that my name is Kevin. He could put that his name is Sam. We could make it sound that we're like another company. It doesn't matter. But when you hover over that or when you right click on it, you'll actually see the real email. So although this says Amazon, it looks like Amazon. You see this and it's management at mazoncanada.ca. That's not an Amazon email address, but unless I hover over it or right click on it, I'm not gonna have seen that. Uh, another kind of telltale sign is when it's a generic non-personalized greeting, right? So they didn't take the time to do the variables, which they're starting to do a little more of, but these are usually still pretty bad. So it'll say something like, you know, dear sir, dear madam, or it'll just say dear, or there will be no, uh, no greeting or something as generic as dear client. And oftentimes you can do the same thing with the link, just like you can with an email address. So as you know, in Outlook or any other email provider, you can type in a link and then embed whatever link you want there. You can type in the verbiage that you want. It could say free market study or whatever we wanted to do for our purposes. And then the link is something else. So this looks like www.amazon.com. Okay, well that looks legit. When you either right click or hover over it, this was the actual website, redirect.whateverthatis.com. And so at the end of the day, you know, this looks legit, this looks legit, this link, it clearly says this is Amazon. But when you hover over some of these, you'll see uh, just how quickly they reveal themselves that they are not the case. This is another one that I thought was really good. And this is one that I actually got um, at one point. And so I got Verizon is my carrier. So it doesn't take much to know that there's three or four major cell phone carriers in this country. So if I spam, I don't know, two or three million people with Verizon, there's a good chance that half of them will probably have Verizon. So that already spoke to me. And it says your bill payment was applied to your Verizon wireless account. Here are the details of your payment confirmation. Payment amount, $1,134.68. This is not even, there's not even a call to action here. It's saying, thanks so much for your payment. I see this number of $1,134 and I'm like, oh my gosh, my nephew got a hold of my phone and must have downloaded like 27 different versions of Fortnite and badges and Angry Birds and stuff. So that made me nervous. What's the first thing that somebody's going to do when they see that? I got to manage my account real quick and make sure that, you know, what happened? What happened? And they conveniently put that button right here. So in my case, I was like, this seems kind of weird. The email did look pretty legit. Um, there was an extra O in something in Verizon, um, but it looked pretty legit. But all I did was I went to my Verizon account. I think it was probably through the app on my phone. I opened it up and obviously that was not the case at all. And so this was a great phishing attempt, but look how legit this looks. It has the same disclaimers. It has the same addresses. It has the same you know headquarters, same graphics. But what happens? You see this number and you're like, oh no, I've been overcharged. That's not good. And so the social engineering at its finest um, so email compromise and wire fraud. This is theft of real estate transaction proceeds by fraudsters who are doing a few things. They're hacking into one or more emails, just like Kevin talked about being into the realtor email. I always say this, I am a realtor still. Uh, I'm not throwing shade as the kids would say, but 95% of the time, the way this happened is through the realtor's email. And the reason is just like, just like many of us, we use free email services they're not quite as secure. And so that ends up being a target. And on top of that, our information is everywhere. If you're a real estate agent and you're doing your job right, your information is all over the internet. You are everywhere your clients could possibly be. It's easy to find your phone number. It's easy to find your email address. It's easy to find a little bit about you and about your profile, about your family maybe, because we're promoting ourselves as real estate agents. So the downfall of doing a great job of, of promoting yourself as a real estate agent is our information is everywhere and they know we're involved in transactions. So they create an email address oftentimes that closely resembles somebody involved in the transaction. You'll often see a letter missing or a letter wrong or an additional letter. They'll watch activity of the hacked email account for transactions that are about to close. And then right before it's about to close, they're impersonating somebody involved in the transaction and they're redirecting funds by saying, hey, here's the new wiring instructions. We just changed our banking relationships. So this is the way it's going down in this case almost every time. And so it's important to know that it's not like it's getting super creative every time. This is how it's happening. 
And when you look at the age ranges, uh, these are 2020 numbers from IC3, which is the Internet Crimes Complaint Center through the FBI. You look at under 20 and then over 60, right? So under 20, those people probably don't have a lot of money to spend anyway. But you start looking at the largest segment of home buyers, right? Millennials, right in here. Uh, about 160,000 uh, cases of wire fraud for a total of about $700 uh, million, right? Then you look at the ages and you start to look at, at, as the ages increase, people that did not grow up necessarily on a computer from first grade and kindergarten, right? People that are not uh, involved in transactions, maybe all that much at this point, almost a billion dollars from that segment of over 60, right? But that said, it is spread out. These are millennials that are supposed to be good with technology and we know what's going on. And it's $700 million in losses. And this is 2020. And these numbers have almost doubled, by the way. So um, we think it has to do with age range, but it's happening to everybody. And then you look uh, at losses by state and you look right here, Florida, 295 million ranked number four in losses in 2020 right? There are high value real estate transactions happening and there are a lot of them happening there. And so you look at some of the big states, it kind of follows population centers, right? The more, the more real estate transactions, the higher the population and the higher the, the, the sales amounts, um, the higher these numbers are. So uh, I see three by the numbers 2020. And obviously these numbers are, they're always updated. I don't even know if 2021 is out yet. It probably is, but they usually take four or five months for it to be out. Um, so over 2000 complaints a day to this call center of the FBI, over 5 million complaints reported since 2000, $4.2 billion of losses in 2020. Read that number again, 4.2 billion with a B in losses in 2020 alone. Right. So 44, uh, 440,000 complaints received per year on average over the last five or so years. And those numbers are just continuing to go up. <clears throat> so at the end of the day, we think, well, this won't happen to me. I saw it on TV. You know, people, they don't know what they're clicking on. Like they don't know any better, but this won't happen to me. Nope, not at all. At the end of the day, I think that's one of the biggest problems is that we think it can't happen to us, right? It only happens to other people. Maybe we know them, maybe we don't know them. Usually it's somebody on TV. You see somebody like Kevin that was able to come in and kind of save the day for somebody and you makes you feel like, well, even if something were to happen, there's all these stop gaps. And it's just not that, that simple. You could ask Kevin what the amount of work and the amount of time that he put into trying to help that person to get back half of that lost money. And I can guarantee like that, is so rare. There's a reason why he got an award for it. There's a reason why he's talking about it. There's a reason why it's on the news. Because at the end of the day, most times it's just gone and it is what it is. Worldwide cybercrime costs will hit $6 trillion by 2021 was the prediction. And it was beat. That was the prediction. And it was beat. Um, so I, I'm pounding it in our heads because at the end of the day, it can happen. But we're going to wrap up the class with talking about how to protect ourselves. In the meantime, I want to share a story from our directs uh, in Oregon uh, for a gentleman named Aaron. I was halfway between uh, work and Clackamas going to deliver some parts, driving the shop truck, and uh, got a call that said uh, we were, they were ready to send me some wire instructions. And I told the nice lady on the phone that I'd already taken care of that about a week ago. And she said, oh, that's wonderful. And then uh, she started looking into it and says, are you sure? So well, what do you mean? And so yeah, what did you send me the email? I sent it to her and she instantly says, oh my goodness, you know, this isn't us. That was the worst feeling in the world, knowing that I had to go home and tell my wife that, you know, stop packing and stuff. I know we have already sold our house, but now we're not getting our other house because I don't have any money left. It'll never happen to you, never, until it does. And generally when it does, it's, it's, it's brutal. It is disastrous. What generally happens is someone's email account has been compromised. So they're looking at your emails for a long time. There's scripts that will look at every email that comes into that email account and they will key on keywords, transaction, closing, and then it will notify them that, hey, an email about this came up. 
And then they start seeing, you know, the transaction. They say, well, who are all the parties? I'd sent probably 150 emails back and forth. And then I get another one and it looks exactly the same as what I've been doing. It looks like it comes from the same place. Uh, the only difference is they change an the email address slightly so you, you can't tell. You know, They actually put the real phone numbers of the people that they were impersonating at the title company in their signatures, of course. So if I had picked up the phone and called the number for the lady that they were impersonating, she would have known instantly that she didn't send me that. This is a social engineering attack, right? It's a sudden change. Um, it's a sense of urgency and there's a consequence. And if you have those three things together, you should stop. Mine was actually less than what they get on average when they get somebody. That's insane. Can you imagine if you had $130,000 in cash sitting in your hand and, you know, someone walked off with it. When it comes down to doing anything serious, like moving money, go see someone in person, go pick up the phone, you just have to slow down and make sure that you know what you're doing is what you want to do. So when you look at it like that, it really you put a face and a voice with the victims of this stuff, right? And I think we forget as real estate agents and people in the real estate industry that uh, we do this every day. We're used to it. We know what's going on and we stay up to date. People like Kevin keep you up to date on what's happening. We have classes like this. Our clients and our customers don't. And so it is our job to educate them from the very beginning. And I think this is one of these points, but before I go through these eight tips to keep your transaction secure, we have the chance as a real estate agent to be the hero, right? If we talk about changes in wiring instructions, don't, don't wire any money before you talk to me. Don't wire any money before you talk to our contact on the phone or in person at the title company. And then they get an email right before closing with a change of wiring instructions. They see it and they think, oh my gosh, lady told me about this. She said this could happen. I'm going to pick up the phone and I'm going to call her. And you say, hey, stop right there. Call Kevin. Let's figure out what's going on. No, that's not from us. You just saved that person, potentially their life savings. Do you think that they're going to tell everyone they know about what almost happened? Do you think they're going to tell everyone they know that if you're going to do a real estate transaction, here's the people you need to use because they're looking out for you. So we have the chance to become the superhero in the situation by just informing them from the very beginning. So if you don't already have it as a realtor, build a standard warning about wiring, uh, wire scams in your email above your name. Put it above your name. Don't put it at the bottom where we never read it. Put it above your name as a real estate agent. At the beginning of each and every transaction, tell your clients what your communication practices are, what to expect, and what you and others will and will not ask of them. Don't forget to keep telling them. You will not get an email changing wiring instructions from a title company, ever. If you do, pick up the phone and call them or call me at a known number. If you beat that drum over and over from the beginning, when they get that email two days before closing, instead of just flowing right through it and doing it, there's going to be a trigger in their head that will go up and they're going to call you or they're going to call Kevin and it's potentially going to save them their life savings in some cases. Let your clients and your partners know to call the title company at a known number. In the Aaron Cole example, they were so lazy, they actually left the real number in the signature line. Had he called the number, he would have talked to them and realized this is not good, stop right here. Most cases, they actually, they change the number. And these are not necessarily, you don't uh, call this person and talk to them and think like, whoa, this is fishy. These are people that are literally like, hello, you know, XYZ title or XYZ lending mortgage company, can I help you? Oh, you know what? They're in a closing right now. They're in a meeting right now. Can I have them call you back? Was there anything I could help you with? Oh, I was calling about verifying wiring instructions. Oh, okay, I can do that for you. That's how that person sounds. So we want to avoid that call to begin with by calling, making sure they call people at a known number. So this one, um, I am talking to myself as a real estate agent, and I am talking to you as a real estate agent. Clean out your email often. The less data in there, the less likely you are to fall prey to these schemes. If you go back in your email and you look at closed transactions, the amount of personal financial information and, and, and social security numbers and all that stuff that you probably have from old documents in your email. You don't need to have it anymore. 
It leaves you open to liability. So go in and clean out your email regularly um, so that there's less potential for issues there. Um, and I, I love the idea of having completely separate personal and professional emails for that very reason. So never click on any links in an unverified email. That one's pretty obvious. And at the end of the day, trust your gut, right? We normally feel something is wrong, but for some reason we just do it. If we trust our gut and just slow down, like Aaron Cole said, just slow down for a split second, we can save a lot of headaches. Use strong passwords and change them regularly. The last time I did this class in person, I had somebody volunteer. I talked at, on this point. I said, you know, if you go to Gmail, um, when you go to your security settings and your password, it will literally tell you how long you've had that password. And so I said, you know, it's amazing to see how long certain people have had it. I had a woman in the back raise her hand and she's like, I'm embarrassed to say this, but I haven't changed my password in 13 years. And you think she changed her password that day? Yeah, she did. And so change your password regularly and ask your clients to do the same throughout the, the process. I know it sounds kind of funny. Wire fraud and cyber fraud is a real thing right now. So I would recommend that maybe from now to closing a couple times, go into your email and change your password. If you want to change it back after everything is closed to the one you love and you're familiar with, go for it. But leading up to our closing, change your password a few times. That's all we have to do to kick these people out of our email. They will be eliminated from our email if the password is changed. They'd have to figure out another way back in. So as frustrating as it may be, it could save our careers. It could save our clients' livelihood. And the FBI recommends 12 plus characters. Um, who would have ever thought that a password book in the top drawer in my home office would probably be more secure <laughs> than, than having stuff online? So West Protect is an awesome resource for, for Kevin and his team. And we definitely work closely together, i.e. that award that he just received for being on the lookout for his clients and customers to a totally another level compared to most people. And at the end of the day, I know it sounds weird in today's world because all we do is email and text and messenger and iMessage and, you know, WhatsApp, but pick up the phone, um, pick up the phone and verify these things. These are eight very simple things, but at the end of the day, they can mean the difference to our career. So thanks again to Misty and everybody at WFG for having me. Uh, if you want to connect, you can scan this QR code and connect with me on socials. And Kevin and your team at Independence, keep killing it. Keep protecting your clients. You are absolutely treating them um, as a fiduciary and putting their interests before your own, the amount of time, effort, energy, and money you spend protecting them. So thanks for being on the front lines of that. And that, my friends, is Cybersecurity 101. Awesome. Thank you so much. I just love this topic. I think this is one of the one of my favorite topics because we see it every day. You know, we try and get hacked pretty much daily uh, in, in our business. So, uh, you know, pretty much every day we're receiving some type of email.